We have now released issue three of the New Thinking Aloud magazine. Download it for free at newthinkingaloud.org. New Thinking Aloud is a non-profit endeavor. Your contributions to the New Thinking Aloud Foundation make a meaningful difference in our ability to produce new videos. Thinking Aloud Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we are going to be exploring the mythical dimensions of artificial intelligence. With me is my good friend, James Tunney. He is the author of a a book of poetry called Mystic Murmuration. He is the author of two books on mysticism, The Mystical Accord, Sutras to Suit Our Times, Lines for Spiritual Evolution, and The Mystery of the Trapped Light, Mystical Thoughts in the Dark Age of Scientism. He is a novelist and has written two dystopian novels, Blue Lies September and Ireland. I don't recognize who she is. He is a barrister who has lectured on legal issues all over the world. He is a fine artist, and his paintings have been on display in galleries throughout Europe. He is also a leading social critic. His books along those lines include Empire of Scientism, The Disquieting Conspiracy and Inevitable Tyranny of Scientocracy, Tech Bondage, Slavery of the Human Spirit, Human Entrance to Transhumanism, Machine Merger and the End of Humanity, Plantation of the Automatons. And his newest book, about which we'll be talking today, is called The Mythical Aim of AI, Maiming the Mind. James lives in Gothenburg, Sweden, and now I'll switch over to the internet video. Welcome, James. Once again, it's a great pleasure to be with you. Uh, It's great to see you again, my friend. I'm looking forward to the conversation. We're going to be looking at the mythic dimensions of artificial intelligence. And as best I can tell, there are two major themes. Uh, One is a a kind of utopian theme that everything will be perfect once artificial intelligence controls the world and uh, it will eliminate war, it will eliminate poverty, uh, we'll have the best medicines and uh, uh, perfect lives for everyone. And and the other theme is very dystopian uh, as exemplified, I think, in Arthur C. Clarke's novel 2001 and the movie where the the computer basically takes over everything and uh, even while the human is alive overrides the human control and there are many dystopian versions of uh, computers running amok. Uh, yes and there's a, an inherent paradox in that Jeffrey in that why I became interested in particular in the mythic dimension is because the recent arguments or contemporary arguments don't really make a lot of sense to me. It's as if people working in the field have suddenly discovered that AI is potentially dangerous. Now, of course, when we go back to Arthur C. Clarke and we go back to him working with Stanley Kubrick in 1968 uh, on uh, 2001 A Space Odyssey, we noticed the mythic team Odyssey uh, going back to, to Greece. We, we see that the whole point was that the computer was taking over from the human, and that was a prelude towards the evolution of humans and, and transhumanism. So it seems very strange to me that nearly 60 years later, people who are working in the field are suddenly claiming to have realized that AI uh, is, is dangerous. And of course, the ones who have let the horse bolt, who have let the cat out of the bag, who have let the genie out of the bottle, and you notice when they consistently say genie out of the bottle, they're referring to literature which is very non-scientific. 
So, so they are the ones that are claiming now that they will protect us from these dangers through regulation, you know, and this is strange because some of the people that are calling for international regulation is not very interested in international regulation in other contexts, particularly where they can apply to uh, some of his own foreign policy decisions. So it's, it's very, very curious. But in that, as you said correctly, we have this utopianism, and we have a very, very deeper idea coming back from the Protestant Re Reformation about what the objective of science is and what the nature of knowledge is and the epistemology of knowledge and how, how mankind as a fallen species needs to recover knowledge. And that was, of course, related to Francis Bacon and the New, New Atlantis, Atlantis again, another mythic element. So we see that there's a very strong idea uh, which gets stronger over time, uh, which was, it was pointed out by people like Mary Midgley, the great, great philosopher, that futurism represented the mundane aspect of salvation. Once, as particularly at the time of Nietzsche, when they're deciding to, or that God is dead and there's going to be a new replacement, the future becomes the salvation and futurism in particular, the idea that there was going to be a heaven on earth becomes clear. And what, why there is this great fear and trepidation and why most dystopian novels are a reaction against that, as we can see with, with, uh, with Lewis, we can see it uh, in Tolkien, we can see it in Huxley, is they realize that Myths are dangerous. John F. Kennedy said that myths are more dangerous uh, than lies. And if we look at books, New Myths, New, new World, New World, New Myths by uh, Rosenthal, we see that Nietzsche, for example, influenced both the Nazis and, and the Bolsheviks. Now, we don't necessarily have to blame Nietzsche for that, but this idea of myth is a very dangerous one. So it concerns me very, very much that this mythic idea is being promoted. And you hear state as fact that we're going to live in an era of radical abundance. This is the promised land again. At the same time, we're told that the planet is going to be destroyed. So they don't go together. There's something wrong. We have to examine the, the basis of, of this mythic presentation of artificial intelligence. One of the points you make is, is that uh, the whole purpose of artificial intelligence, uh, the whole purpose of cybernetics, really, uh, is something of a control system in uh, ultimately to control the human mind, to control people. And that raises the question of who is going to be in control? Is, is there going to be a, uh, a person or a group of people who control a, a global network of computers? Or is, is the network going to control itself? This is the fundamental argument. My argument is that the reason we're hearing a mythic presentation of AI include not just ancient myths but false myths as well in the popular sense of a myth as something is not not true is precisely to camouflage the true aim of artificial intelligence uh, and uh, i go back to the elizabethan england in particular and the idea of what intelligence is the intelligence has has three aspects uh, and machiavelli noted two Machiavelli noted information about yourself or knowledge about yourself and information about other people. But if we look at someone like John Dee, uh, intelligence had three dimensions. It was information about yourself, information about other people, and it was information about spiritual intelligences. And that's what he was communicating with. So this is the proper scale of consideration of intelligences when you're referring to the totality of possible agency uh, for forces of agency in the universe and that's always been the approach of intelligence agencies and of course when we're talking about intelligence intelligence agencies in that context we're talking about statecraft and state management because ultimately everything as you suggest or referring back to my suggestion is about governance so i believe that most of human history most of human literature most of human myth is about the governance of intelligence and most of the struggles are about governance now that governance uh, relates to who should govern 
who should be in control, who is the legitimate leader, who is entitled to leaders, who is the beneficial leader, and who are the, the, the ones that want to rebel against that. So we also have the myth of the prince, for example, that Machiavelli was, was uh, queuing into, and the idea of the good prince, the bad prince, the prince that wants to struggle against, uh, against the king, the king, the mythic king, all, all these are about governance. So what I say is that artificial intelligence is a central arrow in the quiver of control systems. It always has been, always will, that if we look at the growth of artificial intelligence as a, a kind of trident as well with, with robotics and cybernetics, that ultimately they're all about governance. They're all sponsored by the military industrial complex. And the objective is to control human behavior with a deeper objective that we can have total governance uh, on a global scale uh, through machines. So that's the essence of the thing. And that, that explains the context of H.G. Wells, the world brain ideas of, of, of total control systems. And of course, the scientific elite, the technicians, these are the ones that are going to uh, control in that context. They're going to move beyond national sovereignty and in the transnational spaces, the opportunities created by transnational networks, uh, they will be able to, uh, to run that. And Manuel... Uh, Castells has talked about network theory and explaining how uh, this is very, very important. And you've touched on it in, in some of your interviews uh, with Jacques Fallet as well. He's very uh, big in that area. And also, before I go on, I just want to mention to, for people that don't understand this, and this is a very important aspect of your career from my perspective, that you have been discussing these issues from the start and that you have been there in the first person discussing with the founder of artificial intelligence, John McCarthy, discussing with Marvin Minsky, another leader uh, in the area. You're discussing with Ben Goetzel, who is one of the contemporary leaders in relation to artificial intelligence. And you also demonstrate the rift that was there from the start, uh, that the opposing, the people that realized there was something wrong in this context. Of course, your, your, your friend Theodore Rozak, uh, who is very, very important, who defines the counterculture. And he defines the counterculture not by, by the hippies, but by opposition to the technocratic society in, in his book in 1969. And then, as you have discussed with him, he defines the cult of information, which he was very worried about. He was talking about low-level information and not wisdom. Uh, and you also interviewed Hubert Dreyfus, who criticized the decontextualized aspect of artificial intelligence and the equiparation of uh, the false equiparation of artificial intelligence and human intelligence. So he's referring to what's now regarded as a myth of AI, the biggest myth about the equiparation of artificial intelligence and human intelligence. And you've also talked to other people like Charles Musay, who, who, uh, who was interested in this area. And as, as I recall, he was suggesting that cybernetics, you can trace it in ancient, uh, in ancient cisterns, for example. This was cybernetics for him. Uh, it, it, and he, was, he was, uh, had uh, contact with Norbert uh, Wiener, who was one of the very important people who, who realized the, the problems associated with, with, with this area. Yes, coming of age in the San Francisco Bay Area and in Silicon Valley in the 1970s, all of these issues came to the forefront, both positive and negative. I'd like to go back to a point that you raised uh, earlier about John Dee and his view of three forms of intelligence, the third form being spiritual intelligence, and how that uh, fits into your vision of the proper integration, let's say, of AI into our culture. What we have to do for people that want to understand the world now is we have to change our frame of reference uh, ep epistemologically. Now, even when we use the word frame, notice we're referring to the loom, the loom process, the weaving process, as the universe is woven in, in, in a legendary a mythic context, and that this... This loom is also what the Luddites were fighting against. And the loom is the origin of mainframes. The main reason we use this language is because there was a close connection historically and technically in the, in the 1800s, early 1800s, between moving to punch card systems for, for weaving and what became computers. So 
uh, artificial intelligence is really about the relationship between machines and performing functions or programs uh, or, or, or whatever. So when we, when we come then to consider the world, we have to change our frame of reference. So there's an important principle that people haven't really grasped yet, although it was the basis of the digital age. Uh, if we go back a couple of generations, there were discrete areas of human uh, involvement. There might be one area over here and one area over here, and they were seen to be mutually separate. But with digitization, we get a language that can bring those areas together so they conver co converge. So the process of convergence, especially through digitization, brings together areas that were separate. And what that means is that the silos that we once believed existed no longer exist. The compartments don't exist. The boxes don't exist. So what we have to do is regard the universe more uh, in a total field, the totality, because this is, is how our controllers see it. And I, I suggest that artificial intelligence and cybernetics, uh, as we can see in the work of Stafford Beer, uh, as we can see in, in the work of uh, Gray Walters, for example, who worked uh, also on ECGs and the human brain and uh, is tortoises and robots, etc., we see that they're really interested in everything. So, strangely or, or not, the people who determine the rules of society are interested in all these intelligences. And this is what Norbert Wiener was saying. He said that uh, technology can become sorcery in the hands of gadget worshippers. It's what Arthur C. Clarke said, that is, you, you, you can't distinguish between sufficiently developed technology and magic. And magic is a word that nearly every contemporary speaker on uh, artificial intelligence uses, even before the uh, Senate Judiciary Committee last week, they're using the same things legitimately. They're saying this is like magic. It's like trying to regulate magic. They're saying the genie is out of the bottle. So we see that really these f illusory boundaries are gone. So when John Dee was talking about uh, intelligence and he was trying to communicate, and he did communicate with them, and, and he's trying to develop his, his magic, his language to talk to the angels, the en Enochian magic, uh, etc., he is anticipating some of the discussions, debates we have in the context of close encounters, how we communicate with different, with different beings, uh, how we are today. So nothing of this is new. What, what is new is that we can't regard the world as so static as we have done. We have to open up our minds to a whole range of contexts to understand what's happening. And ultimately, there's a struggle about rules. So if we go back to law, for example, and we go back to uh, management of society, it's about the establishment of rules. And machines and machine learning are about rules. That's what Tur uh, Turing was working on, rules to communicate with machines for to do particular things. That what, that's what Wittgenstein was, was talking about, how you define rules. This is what the great exploration is in language learning uh, models and in mathematics, the probabilities and in information retrieval systems that are, are important in this totality of studies of information theory. So uh, what I'm saying is that really the uh, there is a a struggle for the understanding of comp and comprehension of everything at once there are no discrete uh, domains and into that comes theories of theology and god uh, for, uh, for example as it did for john d as it did for francis bacon as it did as it does now strangely for the artificial uh, intelligence designers who say explicitly and Ben Goetzel has said this, this recently, and, and it's great that they're being open about what, what their views are. They said that we are going to build God. And that, that, that's a very important consideration. Now, you, you have interviewed him, so you, I, 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 I doubt if you anticipated that you were meeting the person who's going to build God uh, along with this. Uh, but it's, it's an incredible claim, uh, incredible hubris. But this is, the, this is the scale that we're talking about in relation to change. So I believe that people who are stuck in, in very traditional modes of thinking and believe that the world is going to go on in the same way have failed to anticipate the multilateral engagement that we need in order to understand the world that we live in now. Well, when it comes to spiritual intelligences, and in particular God, we have uh, many traditions that 
call into question our notions of God. We have the, the Greek idea of the gods overthrowing the Titans, who were the gods before them. The idea of gods being overthrown. We have the Gnostic idea of false gods who pretend to be God. And uh, in particular, I think there's a very strong tradition, uh, one finds it in shamanistic cultures, especially of the trickster, that uh, ultimately God is, is, is such a trickster. In, in fact, George Hansen has written a book called Par The Paranormal and the Trickster. He thinks that's the, the primary myth that defines the paranormal is, is that it cannot be contained. It cannot be understood rationally. It, it defies all rules. Yes, and here, here is the funny thing, and this is a kind of underlying paradigmatic uh, meta uh, myth in, in, in my view. It's about the ruler. You might say it's about uh, a, a parent and a child who goes rogue and rebels against them. It could be the prince rebelling against the king. And this, we begin to see the language, of course, like the Prince of Darkness, for example. We go back to Mani or, or the ideas of Lucifer. And uh, we see it, see it move into the trickster idea. And sometimes Prometheus is regarded as, as a trickster. If we go back to think in terms of, of Lewis Hyde's work. Uh, and uh, there's other tricksters, of course, Loki in the Nordic context, who interestingly develops the net, which I think is interesting because of the, the net is one of the central technological uh, efforts and uh, endeavors in, in this context of building a one world uh, thing. So there's a mythic dimension to this net as well. But the uh, overriding that is a battle for who is entitled to be God. This is what the, this is what the battle is for. So in that, we have the Promethean idea that the Prometheus can sneak into heaven and steal fire off the gods. Now, generally, what the Prometheans fail to tell you is it doesn't end up well in the end because you cannot defy the gods. Now, if you want to replace that idea of the gods with the higher forces or the, you know, the more complex forces, then we, we may get a better idea that you cannot go against certain fundamental uh, principles. We don't have to personify this. And that, uh, that idea is there in relation to Satan as well. But the most interesting one relevant, and, and, and you referred to Arthur C. Clarke, who, of course, uh, you met in a presentation and asked him a, a question, an interesting question as well. So you have another contact there. Uh, the most interesting point to clarify how, how deep this mythic element is and how deep this contest is, is in a book, uh, uh, How the, the World Was Won, when, when Arthur C. Clarke is explaining the history of telecommunication system and the growth. And strangely, in that book, he refers to one of his short stories where he is the central character, and it's called I Remember Babylon. And in this, uh, basically, the people who are deciding to use, use the communication satellites to run the world are, are, are thanking him for his contribution to the communication satellite, and he seems quite content. And they're describing how they're going to use the McKinsey report to help uh, govern uh, the world, I suppose you could say the id, 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 uh, the govern the world uh, in that way. To, to America is going to fall. It's quite a, a quite a remarkable little bit that he didn't have to put in, in his book. But in that, the the, the character says, Hartford says, uh, I like America, but when I think back on Babylon, a cold wind uh, blows through my heart. And uh, what what Arthur C. Clarke suggests is that. Uh, if we go back to Genesis, that God put a curse, and that's the, this is the word they use, a curse on humanity for trying to build one language, a tower to, uh, in the Tower of, of, of Babel or Babel. And what he suggests is that this time they're going to be successful. And he says in that book that this may be more than a myth. And he refers back to Scientific America, which suggests that sixty percent of the languages come from an area north of Babylon. So this is very, very this is very, very strange. This uh, the idea of one, one world, one this is actually a reference back to Genesis and to the Tower of, of, of Babel. But this time, and, and people like Arthur C. Clarke, although you, you, he doesn't like, he's not interested in religious views, regards this as a fundamental myth that may be may be relevant. 
and, and claims, therefore, that the technical evolution towards a one world, new world uh, context, the state of the world, where man, humans merge with machines, is the recovery of this one system that was inherent in the Tower of, of, of Babel. Now, you might think that was an aberration until you begin to read people like Keynes and his description of Isaac Newton as the last of the, the magicians, the last of the great magicians. And he traces him in a lineage back 10,000 years to Babylon and, and Sumeria and Mesopotamia. He, they, they believed, some of these, that this was, a, uh, this was back before uh, before the, the the Jews in the, in Babylon, back before that time, uh, and it, it's very very interesting. So this, so it's not something you expect of people that claim to be uh, very forward looking. They're going back to that, and then when another and last conne uh, connection on Babylon, then we see uh, that around the time that. Arthur C. Clarke said that he is, uh, he believes in this one world coming together through technology. We see Jack Parsons in California and L. Ron Hubbard doing their Babylon uh, reworking, which refers back to Alistair Crowley's uh, ideas of, of kind of reactivating the Scarlet Woman, and, and which goes back to the, uh, the Bible, uh, which John Dee was also communicating with a, a figure called Babylon or a similar, similar name. So although a lot of the uh, Protestant theorists cr criticized the Catholic Church as uh, Babylon, actually the Protestant scientists were celebrating this return to Babylon, which is very, very strange, which is also, of course, the place where a lot of the Torah was, was, was compiled, where the rules are because, last point, the, the, the first great code of laws, and notice the word code, for laws because it's, it's, it's rules for society, was the codes of Hammurabi. And Hammurabi also, this is a myth, uh, he gets his law from Shamash, the sun god. And we have pictures of that in the ancient things of, of the, the law maker getting the rules from God, get the divine. We see that in Moses, you see it in the US Constitution, that it was from God that the authority comes from. An ancient ideas. So, so that struggle is very, the, the struggle is who is entitled to be God? This is the struggle. It, it strikes me, though, that there's always, as, as far as I can see in, in myth and elsewhere, a, a problem that, uh, that the gods are not permanent. Uh, I think this is the, uh, one of the primary insights of Buddhism when they talk about there is no permanent self, so any self, uh, godlike self even, is, is not permanent to, a, a, at all. No god can ultimately sustain itself. Yeah, we can say that, and I agree with that. And if you go back to Erugain and people like that, they, they talk about the thing which is beyond rationalization and the god which is beyond rationalization. But here's the problem with that. The problem is that people like Arthur C. Clarke, and people like Francis Bacon believed in, in, in the biblical superstructure or the structure of myth. Uh, and so when, 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 when Blake is talking about Babylon again, uh, in contrast to the heavenly Jerusalem, uh, not of this world, uh, uh, but that could be re rebuilt or could be brought down, uh, they are, he's taking this as the mythic base of, of the Western, uh, of the world. Now, Bacon and that worked with that. So he used, they reinterpret the Bible at the time of the Reformation, at the time of the Elizabethan era, with the printing press, with interpretation. They, they reworked the Bible to suit their own purposes. And here's the most interesting thing. So it's not about uh, what is important. Is it's, This is the intellectual history. This is the forensic connection that historians of science have said. Now, there's there's a very important idea here, and many scholars have talked about it because it's well established, is that what Francis Bacon came to the conclusion uh, was, and this was the basis of the Royal Society, was the basis of the work in particular of Samuel Hartlib, who was a famous intelligencer, who was the basis of the Republic of Letters in many sense across Europe, a network of people of intelligence. And this is a forerunner of the world brain. If you look at why they were doing this, why, uh, why, for example, Bacon was going or claiming to establish 
Salomon or Solomon's house. This this again recovery back to the uh, ancient times. Why were they doing that? The the conclusion they had come to was that after the fall, that the humans had fallen. So the myth of the fall is the most significant myth in science. This is this is the curious thing in science. So after the fall, humans had fallen. What was the consequence of that? The sin was ignorance. They became ignorant. They lost their faculties. But there was a way to recover that. That was the scientific method. That was instruments. And these instruments would be perfect. They would obviate human error and they would move beyond that. So therefore, the method of induction, etc., and the, uh, the methods in science were part of the reconstruction of paradise or the partial recovery of a pre-existing state. So that underlies a lot of the contemporary ideas of people that are very strongly atheist and they don't realize it when they say, well, I trust machines more than humans and things like this. They are, they are articulating a doctrine of original sin that is peculiar to Protestantism, is peculiar to the Reformation, because as far as I know, listening to rabbis on the Torah, that uh, Judaism doesn't have this same uh, sense of original sin. They have original sin, but it doesn't have the same consequences. It was peculiarly associated with the Protestant Reformation, and it, it was part of the intellectual history of science. And science, and scientism in particular, has been very good to cast off its connections with magic, to cast off its ideas with, uh, or connections with alchemy. Although, uh, if we look at Hubert Dreyfus, who you've talked to, he, in 1965, wrote uh, about alchemy and artificial intelligence. Norbert Wiener wrote a God and, and Golem, and he wrote about sorcery, and he wrote about how artificial intelligence uh, could be like the sorcerer's apprentice, a, a, a classic myth that goes back through Goethe, back to Egypt, and go back, back to the Middle East, uh, a classic story, and, and another story of the monkey's paw, the danger of over-literalism. And this is, uh, so, so when you're talking to uh, Mr. Bigelow, and you're talking to, or you're talking about Arthur Young, and that, the, oh, if you look at great scientists and great thinkers about esoteric things, they accept that there's different levels. There's a hierarchy. There is a hierarchy of, of some type. So we can only intuit this. The problem is when we don't accept that there is a broad scope of interconnected things. And this was the problem for some people in a kind of left brain uh, approach, as McGilchrist would talk about, is that they believed that when they could look down the microscope, like Robert Hooke developing uh, his theories, or look through the telescope like Galileo, certainly... Uh, we could see a lot of things, and our frame uh, changed. But the undue concentration, undue reduction to things we could measure, things we could find by instruments, uh, limited us uh, uh, as well. And if and what happens is that people that begin from the smallest find it very difficult to go to iterate up to higher levels because the lower level conditions their access to the higher level. Whereas in the medieval worldview, it was all integrated. And if we go back to Plato as well, in the Greek context, we had the chain, uh, chain of being, etc., where everything was integrated. And what happened, there was a, a, a reduction uh, because of the scientific method that began to say, well, this knowledge is the end of things. It's not the start. It's not an instrument. It moved beyond some of the things because, of course, Bacon, Boyle, etc. They accepted God existed. It suggests to me that the law or the algorithm are kind of uh, the same in, in a way. And we need laws. We need algorithms. I don't think anybody would dispute that. But at the same time, especially in esoteric culture, but also in popular culture, there is this uh, idea of the renegade hero, the outlaw hero, the idea that the one who breaks all the laws ultimately is also serving a higher good. Yes, because in every society there will be a misuse of law, there will be uh, a taking over of law. If you look at uh, people like Michael Francis, who is in the Mafia, who, who talks about his experiences in, in the Mafia. The Mafia used to read Machiavelli 
because uh, that was, you know, they have a, a textbook book as well. And it's all about rules. So rules are important. But what, if you look at the near-death experience, what does it tell us, in, in, in my view? In my view, it tells us that written into the universe is a notion of justice, that the justice is based on the recognition of the humanity of others, of other beings. And this is a common feature in the near-death experience. When the person goes to the light and they come back, they, they look at it in, in, in the replaying of the life, of their impact on other people. Uh, and the suggestion of that is that at a higher level, love, justice is there. This is why Hamir Abai is claiming that he is consistent with the gods. He's connected with the gods. He's connected with the universe. He's not connected with some old guy with a beard up there. He's connected with the justice in the universe. Now, what the, uh, the outlaw certainly uh, and the antinomian figure is important. Jesus is the antinomian figure in relation to Judaism. He's critiquing over legalization of the Pharisees and the scribes, and he, he, he's trying to get at the spirit which is behind those things, which he believes is forgotten in too many rules. Um, and to some extent now, in part of the mythic presentation, we have AI is the outlaw. AI is the hero that's going to bring us radical abundance. AI is going to rob authorities of their power. AI is going to, to help the downtrodden. I don't believe that, but uh, th this is part of the mythic uh, uh, construction. So uh, the outlaw figure, as Hobbes born on that, ha ha has explained this idea of this, this force which will uh, come from uh, the community to fight in a Robin Hood manner is certainly being played as long as, as well as other myths of AI. The most the most important of them being that AI is uh, an independent force. That AI is inevitable. That AI uh, is emergent. And in the context of those forces, the genie, we are we are helpless uh, as, as well. In your new book, the mythic aim of AI, you used a word that I wasn't familiar with. I think it's uh, immuration. Am I pronouncing it correctly? Yeah, I, I made that up, Jeffrey. You have the word immure, which is, is, is to, to put in a wall or to, to, to put behind a wall. And I, I, I don't know that it exists. I put immure mentalization, that the idea of so that bit. I looked up immuration, and it was a, a medieval practice where they literally entombed people alive, so that there was there was no escape, and they would just die uh, like that. And and you suggest that if we're not careful, that's what artificial intelligence will do to us. We will become imprisoned uh, inescapably in a, a web of artificial intelligence in in, in controlling all of our appliances, controlling all of our communication, listening into every conversation, and, and completely containing the human spirit. Yes, this is what's going to happen uh, before, but that's not the end of it. That's before you're fully integrated into the system and you have no choice. We have, building on the work of the behaviorists, Skinner, etc., people that I think your work would have opposed intrinsically um, and a focus on behaviorism, we have this idea of how weak the individual is when they're isolated. And this is a, a dominant part of the discourse uh, as well. So, yes, I, I took that word immure, We'll see if there's another word in your mentalization. I know it's a big word, but uh, examples of this, the, there's this, the short story by Edgar Allan Poe, and it's a kind of frightening short, little short story. And I think Edgar Allan Poe, we'll have to talk about him again sometime, He's because uh, he was into things like cryptography codes, magic, uh, and the imp of the perverse, what was wrong with, with, with progress. Um, so he has the cask of Amontillado, whereby, for some unknown reasons, a man lures his friend or his associate uh, to his, uh, to being immured, to, uh, he gives him his cask of him, or his amontillado, this great uh, wine, and when he is drunk, he, he takes advantage to, to put him in, in, in a wall, basically. It's kind of, it's kind of frightening. Uh, but I think there's a deeper, there was a deeper metaphor in that. It's when we allow our own base instincts, 
uh, our own greed to lead us into a trap. So what I suggest is that we are going to walk looking at our mobile phones into a trap, a big trap, into a black box. Now, if you, if you think about this dark room that we're going into, it's very interesting that if we think about the black box and what a black box is, and I, I think there's a, strong ca there's a strong case to make that the ideas of the black box, which are fundamental in information systems, uh, goes back to the black chamber in, in France in medieval uh, times. What was the black chamber? Well, basically, you're, you're over with the King of France and you're sending a letter to me back in Ireland about what's going on and you're filling me in. So you seal your letter and I, 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 you say here to the messenger or to one messenger, please give that to such and such. And you think it's going to be safe. So they say, oh, yes, yes, sir. Very much. And they go off and they bring it to the black chamber. And in the black chamber, they unseal it and they, they, they basically intercept your communication and read it. And then they reseal it and send it on. So linked to this black chamber idea, and that was the name of the first major interception system in the early 20th century in the United States in the forerunner of the National Security Agency, the black chamber. So this connection continues. So with, with this black chamber idea in cybernetics, instead of trying to get inside your head, we look at the inputs and outputs and we can begin to determine what's going on inside your head. And what I'm suggesting is that the movement of all these things leads to us becoming in a black chamber, that the, all the theorists, if you look at the people that Ben Goetzel cites, uh, Jared uh, Feinberg, and, and, and going back to uh, Haldane, of course, his famous essays in the 20s, his, uh, alongside Bernal Haldane is talking about Daedalus. So Daedalus, you know, this great Greek inventor is the mythic future. Um, and uh, James Joyce, of course, sees himself as deadless. Artists are in on the game. Uh, uh, artists are in, in on the game as well. And all these, all these things, all these systems, cybernetics, governance, etc., uh, artificial in information, uh, the building of international networks, isolate the individual. Uh, they, they take what were informal social relations and they formalize them. They begin to replace rules, that you can be ruled from outside your country, that the locus of governance become, comes elsewhere, that it's justified on a technical basis that you have no control over, that those that control the technology controls and will control the rules of your life. And they have certain views. They have certain views about your health, about how your body should be managed. If we look uh, again in the Prometheus project that Ben Goetzel talks as an influence for him, uh, they believe that they will, they should take out certain qualities from human behavior that they consider bad. So they have a full program going back to Bernal and others to reprogram the individual to make sure that they become mechanized. This is what they have told us a hundred years ago, uh, and to uh, to have ectogenesis that uh, Aldous Huxley talked about, children born in, in in the womb, and even people that we think are very enlightened like Terence McKenna, he saw us as merely the precursors to a different, a different group. In fact, uh, he talks about us as the ape. That's why he uses the stoned ape and, uh, and ideas like that. And, 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 but you could improve your position with the food of the gods, the psychedelics. This is the notion of prosthesis, for example, uh, because you needed something, a technical intervention to, know, to improve your, your fallen state. Uh, so what is happening is, we are being surrounded, we are being dragged in, uh, we are being made dependent. So as part of this movement with the military industrial complex, artificial intelligence, we will have uh, digital identification is, is coming, uh, you will have digital currency, and basically you will not be able to escape from your inter interaction with the, with the system. Then that can control you, it can control your life. That's what Philip K. Dick anticipated when you're trying to argue with your door going out because it won't let you out in the morning because you haven't paid something. He also wrote an essay called Mr. Spaceship in 1953 about a human brain controlling a spaceship, interestingly. So, uh, yes, what's happening now, we are in the process, the final constriction where we put it in, in an electronic straitjacket. And in this, if we fail to see this be because of the appeal to us, like 
the character in the cask of a Montalada will appeal their senses, say, oh yeah, well this is good, this is convenient, this is nice, I love my servitude. Well then we have to take the consequence. And I criticize all the churches, all the religious establishment for being very slow, slow on this. Uh, I can't believe that if there is an existential threat to the species and the people that they claim they are, are God's uh, uh, creatures, that they can ignore these processes. And uh, it's down to people that are individually aware of the things, aware of the danger. They're not against technology. Uh, I've talked about the techno rebels before. It's not against technology. It's about the application of a very particular control ethos to technology that has to be rebalanced. And that's what your friends were talking about in the 60s. And that's what, uh, again, well, he needs to be rediscovered, Theodore Rozak, on, on, on what he said about humanity. And he did it, not from a religious basis, as far as I remember, talking about our inherent humanity. And they foresaw this because this is what the plans have been from, from the technocrats, technocracy, the technotronic society, uh, scientocracy, a lot of great minds, C.S. Lewis, etc. We've talked about this. So yes, we are going to become assimilated uh, as cyborgs and then uh, merge with the thing. We're, we're not far off. Elon Musk says clearly, you're all cyborgs now because of our dependence on this, uh, on, on this system, if you like, on the extended phenotype. So yes, we're going through this immuremantalization process, which will lead to our being immured in the process, assimilated in the process, encapsulated in the process, compartmentalized, put in a box, uh, and we won't be able to get out of it. And the last point, uh, the difference, of course, between artificial intelligence, human intelligence, is about the spirit and spiritual light. It's not that uh, this can replicate, the dangers of this replicating human spiritual, spiritual achievement. It's like what Quentin Crisp, uh, the the the, the a gay activist, uh, you remember, he was the English man in New York. I met him at a talk in, in Dublin. He, it's more like his philosophy. Don't try and keep up with the Joneses. Drag them down to your level. So we have to fear the loss of our, our, our spirituality in this process of being uh, put into a material network. Earlier you referred to the uh, myth of Daedalus. And you said even the artists are in on the game. Uh, I'm a little confused by that, James, because if I recall correctly, Daedalus' idea was uh, to fly up to the sun, and it worked until he got too close and, and the feathers uh, or whatever was holding the feathers together on his wings melted, and it was Daedalus or his son Icarus or the other way around fell back to earth. Uh, because of that, it, it suggests that uh, even if artificial intelligence succeeds in uh, the immure mentalization of the entire human population, at some point it will collapse under uh, its own in inherent errors. I agree with that. But here is the problem. If we go back and we're able to understand the implications of the change in the late 19th century in views based on evolution, based on myth, and how they had such dangerous and damaging uh, consequences in Germany and in Russia, for example. Uh, we would begin, I think, to question, uh, to question the logical process that led to people like Hitler or Stalin or whoever you want. If you look, if you read, there's a good book, The House of Government, about the Bolsheviks. And a lot of uh, the Bolsheviks in particular, when they were in the period uh, of, of coming into governance, and a lot of the people were driven by myths, were driven by noble aspirations. But there's a great, as Kennedy said, that the, the myths are more dangerous uh, than lies. They can have uh, extremely dangerous uh, consequences. They're extremely uh, powerful. They can motivate people. They can bypass rationality. They can buy, they can, they can, uh, they can play on the harp strings of ancient archetypes that Jung recognized as, as fundamental, that are written into our, our DNA. They, they can manipulate it. That's why marketeers and adv advertisers use it. So what I believe is going to happen, and I, 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 I 
don't think I can see any other strategy is I think that when the next totalitarianism comes, as it will, that it won't be tens of millions, that it will be billions of people that will suffer in that. Uh, so I think that the die is, is cast on that, 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 that the, the consequences of, uh, of the strategies that have, have been set in train will lead to great dev devastation. Uh, that's going to happen. Uh, that, that's my, my view. Um, so in the end, yes, the spirit will triumph. In the end, there will be a fixing of it, but the cost is going to be huge. And in this, you will notice that all the Prometheans are willing to take huge risks. They're risk takers. Risk is good. That's what enterprise is. But there's appropriate risks to take and there's risks that are not worth taking. Uh, Prometheans will take risks, not just with their, well, particularly with other people's lives. Uh, they will focus on the on the power, they will focus. It's interesting about Parsons. He's interested in jet propulsion. He's interested in the, in the power of it. Uh, he's interested in the power of, of, of the occult things. Uh, power and that desire for power is a fundamental aspect uh, of this. So ultimately, the human spirit uh, will triumph in some way. And a lot of science fiction writers, Philip K. Dick, have anticipated this, uh, this uh, type of apocalypse, which of course is, is, is a revelation. But the recklessness of the Promethean viewpoint, as we can see in, and Promethean was used to describe the uh, growth of the atomic bomb and all that, those, those issues. We see this strange, uh, strange idea of the human as gods and Yuval Noah Harari explained it. And I'm very grateful for these people putting their views into the open so we can, we can test them. So, um, and, and I think we have to try and convince uh, people. But he said, yes, there's going to be gods now, that the humans, of course, are just animals, and they're falling down the chain of being or animals. Uh, don't forget that James Lovelock, he wrote Gaia, but his next book, or the next major book, was the Nova scene. We're going to be as plants to this system that looks like what, what, what John Lilly said. So uh, they will take uh, the risks on the basis that the aim that they have to achieve this evolution of humanity, the merger with machines, is justified. And because there are no other aims, this was the point of, of, of the ideas of the Prometheus project in the 60s. Uh, because there are no other aims, the, the reason why the aims were written is because they didn't see any spiritual aims. They didn't see spiritual evolution. They couldn't see it. It's, it's the blindness of the left brain approach. There had to be an aim. And once you had that aim, well, then everything would be justified. And this is the same ethos that have... That, that inspires some of the ideas of the Club of Rome, etc., who are very much into cybernetics as well, that it's, it's justified to lose a few billion people. Uh, it's necessary to use a few, uh, a few billion people. And this feeds into the, the stories about overpopulation, Malthusian ideas that go right back to the British Empire, right back to uh, imperial structures. And in this is this myth of the round table, the myth of the specialist group who have a particular insight to come together. Now, I, I locate that in particular in the Anglo, the Anglo sphere is, is the ones that took that on most particularly. I locate it particularly in the, the British American uh, expansion, the Atlanticist uh, I, I, idea. That's, that's where I locate it, just for just if people are unclear about, uh, about that. And they have a very strong idea, the, the round table, we can see a Cecil Rhodes, for example, all these great imperial build, well, great, I mean, uh, significant imperial builders that wanted to rule the world. We see it coming through Julian Huxley, who's, that they're using, who, who, who coins the term transhumanism, writes about transhumanism following on from the 1920s, but also believes that UNESCO and these international bodies can help achieve that purpose of the one world and this one world which claims to be diverse is based on a standardization homogenization harmonization making everybody the same despite what its pretensions to diversity are it's about a leveling out because this is the way systems work there is also a, a myth and maybe i'm drawing on my jewish tradition my jewish heritage here the idea of uh, jacob wrestling with the angel or uh, the idea of the golem or the idea of frankenstein that, that we create a monster in order th for us to have something to contend with one might even say an opponent that's worthy of us 
that, that we're challenging ourselves in this regard. There is that sense, if you want, of the, the dialectic, but it, it, comes down to, it comes down to a fundamental question about who we consider, who we consider uh, humans are, what we consider they are, whether we value them. And, and again, an undercurrent in all these debates, nearly, nearly all the, the AI people that I've heard, they talked about us as being kind of regressive apes. Now, this is paradoxically... Uh, an unscientific perspective because uh, in, if you look at the closer at the evolutionary theory they explain about common ancestors and that but they don't say that uh, humans and apes are equivalent in that context and in particular to cite Richard Dawkins he talks about the extended phenotype and the significance of the environmental constructions in human culture that distinguish us from there but this ape idea is very very strong where that comes from is it comes from Thomas Huxley, and it comes from the uh, the empire of scientism in the 19th century, the extrapolation from Darwin's theories uh, in, in relation to evolution and the misappropriation of those theories and application to racial science, which has been devastating. So some people who claim to be scientific, who claim to be knowledge, knowledgeable, are repeating imperial myths about uh, about human nature which have been very destructive which 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 makes me concerned uh, so that is it that is in contrast to the idea of the dignity of the individual to the uh, to the idea which is underpins or should underpin all theological uh, basis it certainly does in judaism it certainly does uh, in christianity and islam about the divine aspect of the uh, of of the human and it does in in, in other contexts in gnostic contexts as well the divine spark uh, uh, that element so the uh, in relation to the the golem uh, and this I, I think we can see it in terms of a projection of the dark side of us and an exploration of the dark side of us the only point that i would say is uh, and that, that, that could be the point for the point of contrast for to force us onto the next level. So, uh, and you talk about this, this, this necessary force uh, uh, in the universe. The only problem is that the level of destruction that we can unleash now through negligence, through not understanding who we are, through an unduly left brain focused, through the nature of the people who are gaining the levers of power because of their left brain focus, who are trying to project that onto a world, who are blind to some of the of, of other things, who are blind to our spiritual nature, who don't accept this, they can unleash uh, massive, massive damage, massive destruction uh, uh, on this. The golem, uh, as you rightly say, or Frankenstein, which of course was uh, subtitled the modern Prometheus. She's not criticizing, she's quite sympathetic towards the construction. She's criticizing the scientific conceit and hubris that believes that they are the creator, that want to be the creator. And what, what the scientific method did was gave a pro Promethean glimpse that says, well, actually, if we build from this inductive method, we can induce God. We can we can uh, we can construct God, uh, or we can make God, or we can become the gods. You know, with perhaps some Zeus uh, there overseeing, and the Zeus could be a computer now, the machine to govern, as as was developed. Other people in this area, Carl Deutsch, for example, wrote in in the sixties after conversations with Wiener about uh, the nerves of government, about how. There would be construction uh, of a system. So, in many ways, this is a projection. This is a projection of a body. The nerves of government. You're you're constructing a being. So, this one that people talk about, the one world, the one world government, the new world, the new one. It's a kind of it's a bastardization of Plotinus's one. It's 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 a material conceit, a reflection of the uh, idea of the spiritual one of of the higher thing now ultimately that will win the the hierarchy of the spiritual thing will win and i also believe that there are consequences that you, that i'm a bit more I, I believe the university has a bit more consequences for one's behavior that that it is, it's a just universe and also that the universe itself will punish uh, as the gods will punish if you want to put it in another way 
So uh, that's why I want to persuade people who, who, are, who are advocating this transhumanism, who are advocating this artificial intelligence uh, as a necessary, inevitable, this is another myth that they use, an inevitable uh, development and an inevitable ability of the merger of humans and machine. Uh, I, I, I think that's wrong and I would point to them a significant, his last point, historical example of this thinking. Once governments begin to say something is inevitable, it's dangerous. This was the word that was used in the Downing Street memo of 2002, which was published by the Times in 2005, where the Blair government goes over to America and they come back to the head of the Secret Service, Intelligence Service, and says, the Americans say that war in Iraq is inevitable. And the, 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 the British government joined in then. And they said they were going to make intelligence to suit this story. That's the, that, that, that's the way it worked. It's not inevitable. Uh, it, it's mythic. Uh, what is inevitable is that the hierarchy of the universe and the spiritual forces will continue. They will assert themselves uh, eventually. But, uh, and that, that is a real world and a real world conflict. And, and, and uh, there are forces uh, contending. But if individuals succumb and acquiesce to systems and really suggest to the universe that they don't want their free will, that they're willing to give it to machines. Well, I think there's consequences about that as well. So it is a challenge uh, and uh, it is a defining challenge and it is a, a one that was anticipated in some sense in the, in the apocalypse and the restoration and, and, and it, is, it, it is there. But uh, really what it does is requires individuals to focus on what's important that, that that's why I, I don't want to sound too pessimistic it's the very raison d'etre of the spiritual of spiritual consciousness of spiritual expansion of activation of consciousness of recognition of all the things that you've been you've been putting on the table in your whole career they say look at uh, the world is a lot more complex it's a lot wider you're more uh, it's, it's stranger it's more mysterious it's more un unpredictable. We don't understand what we think we're going. We do understand, and that therefore you should recognise who you are. So ultimately, there's an optimistic point there, but we have to recognise uh, and be real about what's happening and explain the intellectual trajectory of, of these movements. Well, let me try and pin you down because a little earlier I thought I heard you say that the immure mentalization, which is a wonderful word. It's either inevitable or it's already happened. And now I think I hear you saying it's not inevitable that we can resist it. Oh yes, yeah. No, don't 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 let me sound uh, too defeatist about this. It's inevitable in the sense of a description of a phenomenon which is ongoing, predetermined, uh, an enterprise that's been going on for a while, an enterprise inherent in governance an enterprise inherent in human nature. Uh, this makes the attempted immormentalization an inevitable feature of the contemporary era that we're living in. And that will be successful to some degree. People will succumb. They will be willing to get the chips in their head. They will be willing to uh, engage in all that. And uh, so to a certain extent, there will be a change. I've said in a number of contexts, there is a fork in the road. There is, a, there is clearly a shift. Uh, the shift uh, for the transhumanists is to humans 3.0. 3 it's to some other force, as Tegmark talks about. I say that the shift on the other direction is to people who are focused more on their spiritual consciousness, who are reclaiming their spiritual consciousness. And they are going to resist, and they are going to rebel, but it, uh, there, will be a, there will be a lot of people that will succumb to that process, and I believe that has consequences. But the people who believe in their spiritual consciousness at a certain point will do what Toffler anticipated. They will become non-violent techno-rebels and understand that they can work in this environment and they can change it, but they have to be aware. So this process will happen on a mass scale, as happens in a lot of contexts, there will be small groups of people who, who, who resist. You've, you've talked before about, about what would have happened if your family had stayed where they were uh, historically you know, and didn't you know, move, for example. 
this this is this is what happens uh, in history uh, so uh, the similar processes uh, th uh, that that people escape things or whatever but the processes themselves are real uh, and until and how long that could be it could be it could be a long time it, it it is the the essence the objective the aim of the technological society and it's a very successful technological society it will be a very hard force to resist as we're made dependent on them but some will do but I, I, i'm not i don't i don't necessarily mean that the mass of people will succumb in fact people like gunter anders and that hannah arendt they were suggesting that this process was kind of happening uh, well with gunter anders in particular through from television it was beginning and they would have seen quite a degree of it now they didn't see or experience the range of intervention that, that, that we are seeing and that uh, that philosophers and jeremy are talking about the mention park in a positive way the human zoo that we're that, that we're talking about that we're moving into this position and people say oh well you're talking on zoom etc zoom zoo well prisoners in jail can tap on the pipes and communicate to each other it doesn't mean that they they have freedom there's an illusion about some of the degree of freedom that that, that we know every keystroke that that we we, we we press is recorded and here's the last point on this data protection was a great movement that i taught about and, and and they told us that data protection was to avoid what happened in nazi germany when the germans used the punch card system etc to get information and, and, and which is true and uh, ibm the holocaust so that's why they were regulating uh, data uh, and they did and they do regulate of course data for you know for private companies etc but the government has never has never uh, got or trawled up more information as it does uh, th th than it does now. Uh, so we had this: oh, we're going to regulate, and they use the process of regulation to increase the danger that they claim that they're, you know they're, they're omitting or, or obviating. Similar thing happens now with AI that they will utilize the process of regulation in order to gain more control over us on the supposition that what they're doing is good and what we're being asked to. Uh, uh, to do is to allow the fox take over the chicken coop. So the people that are making the technology, that are releasing it, are saying, "Look, uh, you better listen to us. It's dangerous. We are going to take over. We are going to help with the regulation. It, it, it's a uh, uh, it's, it's a dangerous process." And um, so I'm not optimistic. The phenomenon is there. People will resist, but it's going to be very, very difficult. And people have to be very, very clear about what the process is. They're going to be have to be very, very critical about the conveniences they accept, and very, very critical about the ongoing processes that are going to. They're happening very, very quickly through the drafting of the World Health Organization treaty, through the movement towards uh, digital currencies, which which are and these are going to move very, very quickly, and they will they will be expedited on the basis of crises. They will be expedited on the basis of things which make us believe that the regulation is, is, is worthwhile all tend towards the creation of a global structure which is not properly global which will uh, which will purport to be global but will really reflect the interest of the pre-existing powers that projected these onto the world by which you mean the anglo world in particular yeah as it's, ex it's expanded it has to expand you can see the shift of the financial centers you can see the creation of ex, uh, ex imperial uh, financial structures right over the Middle East, connections uh, in in the, the, the states over there, which are being used as a, as a locus, as a shift. Because this is very interesting. If you go back to uh, Arthur C. Clarke, H. G. Wells, they believed that the future government of the world would be back somewhere around Basra, Babylon, Middle East. They're going back to these areas, including. The re-establishment of Solomon's Temple. That's what this this recovery is. That's what we've talked about, John Nelson Darby. I I, I implore my Protestant friends to re-examine their theories about the rapture and to look at where it came from. I don't believe I, uh, while they're waiting for this recovery, the world is being taken over by other mythic uh, so, uh, sources. Yeah, there's, there, there's a the. the Imperial forces have joined with uh, transnational corporate things of all descriptions in order to 
uh, camouflage its, its original origins. It has become properly globalized in that. And there is a global elite of people that are from all races, all groups that are contributing towards this vision, in particular because of their technocratic uh, bent, the, uh, the, the opportunities that they have in that. It's much more expanded. But at base is that Atlanticist core. Yeah? And certainly, as, as has, uh, other theorists have said, the sea powers were very, very important. The, the Atlantic, the control of the sea, which led to the control of the telecommunication system, uh, w which goes together. Yes. Yeah. So I gather, uh, while so much of our focus seems to be on the political, uh, I'm trying to find the right word for it, but you, you might say the United States, according to some people, is on the brink of civil war with, you know, Democrats versus Republicans, conservatives versus liberals. I think what I hear you saying is that something much deeper is going on and that what we think of as the major political dividing lines in our country uh, may, may be misguided, that they may both be actually working towards this, uh, this globalist vision that you're describing. I've no, I have no doubt about that. The... the I, I've had a lot of contact with people that work in international context and seen this process and witness it close up and from from legal contexts, my, my own experience from people that were in politics. And what has happened is that power has been sucked up into international networks. And this is the objective. So that therefore the Catholic r Church is regarded as a the largest NGO in the world, non-governmental organization that has to be assimilated into the process. This is the, w the way people see. So they have, the and, and the Chinese as well um, believe that uh, the book America versus America, that America is going to collapse from the in internal in te uh, the internal tensions. But this was, this was uh, based on, or, or what's behind this, is I think uh, Brzezinski's ideas of the Technotronic Society explain a lot more that really there was a movement towards a global system of power. So the people that are going for that are willing to sacrifice their countries. That was the implication in the I Remember Babylon's story. So they will sacrifice national sovereignty for the reward of this system that they believe in for technical reasons or geopolitical reasons or sometimes because the scientists know that they have unleashed powers that can't be contained and they realize that uh, the forces they have unleashed will lead to destruction and that the world is, is, is too unpredictable. Or more importantly, because we have a particular political trajectory, as we've talked about in relation to H.G. Wells. So uh, on that view, uh, the United States will collapse in, 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 in the context of a movement towards a globalized structure that the elite groups in the United States, which are associated with technology, which are associated with control, which came out of the deep state, uh, for, uh, for example, which were promoted in many senses by the deep state, which is in many senses is beyond political control in the black projects, you know, there's black projects, black chamber, who, who, who reflected a deeper desire for global stability, which could be justified on the basis of uh, into, uh, of global uh, instabilities on, on some noble goals, that all these elite systems, as was anticipated by people who wrote about the managerial class and the managerial revolution, are able to, out of common interest, come together uh, in corporate forms. The Chinese Communist Party is a successful corporate form. Corporate forms can cooperate. So the Chinese could, example, work with, with uh, elites in the United States, that the elite structures, which are beyond national control, uh, can operate together. There's no, in the United States, you have the Sherman Act. It can apply extraterritorially, but it doesn't really apply to action on a global scale. That means that corporations are not subject to the power. If you go back to Bill Clinton talked about this in his presidency, that power was shifting in his time to these international companies, much more powerful than, than nation states. They can buy and sell them. Power has shifted. Governance has shifted towards corporate, uh, corporate governance. Now, BlackRock and the big companies, I call it BlackRock Bolshevism because it's a mixture of the both. They can work together. Black, uh, BlackRock, for example, enforces governance goals, social, economic, uh, cultural goals on 
companies that it's going to invest in. So the governance is coming from corporate forms and it's coming through technology. The technology is a governance system. So this global governance system replaces, it has happened largely already, that the national sovereignty that you have in the United States has been severely constrained, whittled down, reduced through various international agreements, through uh, World Trade Organization, ones that the American benefits from. You're, you're, the current American president has said there's going to be a new world order and we will govern it. So the idea is that the new world order will take the power structures that exist and they will extrapolate and, and be able to operate on a different level. And so, so, so national sovereignty is fairly, very weak. The only places that are successfully maintaining it are places like China at the moment, Russia, you could say. But in relation to the Western context, they have made a decision that national sovereignty is no longer important. And especially to, that, that's what the e European community uh, is about. So, yes, I, I, I think that uh, both parties uh, in, in the United States are embedded in a system which is committed to other goals. And a lot of this is a punch and duty, tweedledum, tweedledee thing, that ultimately, while all this theatre is going on, that the power is is moving towards these governance systems, that they won't be controlled, they'll be harder to control at a local level, a national level, a state level. Uh, I, I believe that is the implication of the current trajectory now. I know you are aware recently of my conversations with Robert Bigelow in which he, he brought up the question of AI and he made a point of saying there's no soul uh, to AI. It will not, for example, uh, survive death. There's no AI in the afterlife. And I think uh, by implication, the same would be true of all of these corporate governance structures uh, that we're talking about. They lack soul. Uh, yes, but this is the point that Quentin Crisp was saying in this flippant way. Don't try and keep up with the Joneses. Drag them down to your level. Uh, that's, you know, you know, trying to keep up with the Joneses. The point is, it's not about whether AI can have a soul, it's whether it can take away our soul. This is what Steiner talked about. So Steiner predicted that the Aramanic forces would take away the human soul. This is what the objective, if you like, of the Satanic, Luciferian, Aramanic uh, perspective is. This is what the, the implication of Mammon, Moloch, all, the, all, all those uh, old uh, Middle Eastern uh, deities, this, this is what it is. It doesn't, it wins not by it getting a spirit, because the point is that these entities don't have spiritual light. And that's why I define the human as. But they're capable of taking away your light. I don't mean you personally, Jeffrey, but they're taking or my light. This is what the, the point is. And so what becomes difficult, and Steiner anticipated this, he said, it's never going to go away now. We've crossed that uh, boundary. There's always going to be this struggle with the machine. And the machine is going to take uh, the human spirit. Uh, so that's what I'm concerned about. That's correct. But uh, if we, for example, lived our life in a drunken stupor, for example, we, you couldn't, on any guess about what the afterlife is, you couldn't uh, anticipate that that was a good basis on which to go into the next world, for example. By the same token, if we become addicted to artificial intelligence and we become possessed by it, technically, or it possesses us, or, for example, we get our upgrades so we can have a, do a whole lot of calculation, and there's an opportunity cost. If this, is if this is making us do things, we can't do something else. Well, then the problem is that we can't develop, but we put into cold storage. Uh, there is, there is a, a different perspective in, in Philip K. Dick that he believed in some ways that some of the spiritual things were artificial intelligence. I, I could, it was one bit that I found difficult to get, but I think it may be possible that in a lower levels or lower dimensions there are some reflections of beings that are artificial intelligence or were in some way. And, and I mean, it's a bit interesting to have mechanical elves. That on a lower astral plane, there may be some possibility of crossover or something uh, uh, in the context of the understanding of, of, lo of higher level physics and, and Feinberg was talking about tachyons and things which are faster than light there may be an intermediate zone which is actually not 
a higher level spiritual domain, which is an intermediate zone. I think the grey zone is an area that uh, Evelyn Underhill talked about, which I think is kind of ignored in this. It might be the zone of hungry ghosts. There, is an, there, there may be an intermediary zone, but this is not the zone that the mystics are talking about. And Evelyn Underhill is very, very clear. We may have to go through these zones, but we have to go, the mystic has to go through them to the higher zone. And in the higher zone, as far as I can see, and all my understanding is, as you know, that we are spiritual light, which is a higher force. It's, a, it's part of the divine uh, nature. It's, it's, it's what the divine consciousness is constricted. That can never be that, but it can imprison us in order to stop our development and the imprisonment you say well that's unfair the gods will help you the god now that, that, that that's another story we have to talk about their uh, intervention to, to stop this from the divine sense but there's another point it's what c.s lewis says that the 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 roads to the, the, the most successful roads to hell is a slow one nice and soft and low that it's we have ac acquiesced to this we have engaged in, in, in this acquiescence. So it's a bit like Dr. Faustus, that it, we may not sign one great consent to give our soul away, but if we sign, it's like a death by a thousand cuts. We have a thousand consents and bit by bit, you know, uh, bit by bit, literally information se sense, we give away more and more and more till there's nothing left. We have consented every step of the way. And there is this strong idea in all the occult traditions, that you have to consent to this. But you can also do it by one pebble on top of each other until it becomes unbearable. So it's, it, it's that gradualism is a big... So I agree with... Uh, of course that's right, uh, what Robert Bigelow said. But that's not the problem that Steiner identified, and I agree with. The problem is, can it impede our spiritual light, even cognitively? They, they've convinced us... From it's interesting. Last point, Jeff. The X Club was what Huxley, what, what Huxley used to take the spirit out of science by infiltrating or creating an idea, and that's where psychology came from. We've talked about that before, uh, around Russell Square and all that. And uh, interestingly, Deep Mind, the company that was uh, bought by Google, based around Russell Square. Interesting, the 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 uh, the, the, the same area, uh, but the. Uh, in that is the idea that our spiritual light will not be able to escape this this process and that we are consenting by not recognizing it, that the x club now that huxley said we have twitter has become x x is, is an interesting <laughs> i mean I'm, uh, it's a continuity uh, they're, they're, they're telling you what, what, what's going on you're, you're, there is a process of dispiriting, there is a process of depersonalizing, there is a process of dehumanizing, there is a process of taking away the species, that's uh, post the movement towards post-humanism. So uh, they're telling you that the species is finishing, so the spirit is a minor, is a minor loss uh, uh, in the overall scheme because most of them claim to not believe in it, although I, I, I think they do. So... Um, that's that's where where the, the the slight difference of emphasis. So I agree with that, but we have to consider the other positive. That we have to consider a sword and a shield. Yeah. Well, in closing, James, let me ask you uh, to elaborate on one interesting metaphor I found in your new book, the mythical aim of AI. You refer to a stagecoach uh, heading towards a, a major cliff like the Grand Canyon going slowly and leisurely. Could you amplify on, on that? Uh, yes. Um, if you look at the law of negligence, uh, the basis of the law of negligence was a case in 1932, uh, Dunahoo and Stevens, and they said that a manufacturer of products that he sells in such a form as intend to reach the ultimate consumer in the form which they left him, owes a duty to the ultimate consumer to take reasonable care in the putting up for sale of, of, of the product uh, uh, if there's no means for a reasonable uh, inspection. So the duty of care came from the Christian principle of having care for your neighbor because the judges said, well, who in law is my neighbor? It's someone that can be affected by your actions. And this is a principle that we've accepted. So we have a theological base coming from a good rule, which, which, which means, therefore, the companies uh, had to take care. So care is a fundamental aspect of compassion. It's, it's considering the other person. This is what people claim to do. The Promethean viewpoint has doesn't care about other people. It doesn't even care about the gods 
Now, these are the Titans as well. They don't care about humans. They, the, the, the humans may serve their purpose as well, but they don't even care about the higher gods. So why would you expect them to, uh, you know, to care about the lower gods? Implicit in that is a gross recklessness, which you can see in a lot of Prometheans. They will take chances which are wild. They will suggest policies that are absurd because it satisfies their own uh, claim to be superhuman, which is another great myth that Superman, the superhuman, the Ubermensch that, that, that Nietzsche, uh, Nietzsche put forward. Now, that was criticized by Aurobindo, who says, well, this is not the spiritual superperson. This, this is not what it meant. So in all this, I see a gross recklessness. The idea that now you could say that you are going to create God is so absurd to me. It's so, it's so, uh, there's so much hubris in this. It's, it, it is such a claim. It is such a, there's such a recklessness inherent in this of the people that are claiming that they are going to rule us and will probably rule us. Their, their work is going to affect our daily life. So these are the people that, that, that we're tolerant. And, and in that is this, is this gross recklessness associated with the idea that they are the ones, they are the, uh, the elected ones. They are the elect in the Protestant context. This, this view is very, very important in Calvinism, in the history of empire. They were chosen. And implicit in this, which is not sufficiently critiqued in the Protestant mindset, is a view that once you're chosen, well, then you can break the rules as well. This is in certain traditions of Protestantism. <laughs> so they all contribute towards this gross recklessness, which fails to, to, to be aware of the other person. In, in another context, uh, I think with the Empire of Scientism, I had people driving a car towards a wall, because there will be a wall, I've no doubt about this, or, or, or a cliff. It's a game of chicken if, it, if it's not going to hit the wall. And it is that kind of, there's a, a kind of adolescent willingness to take chances. And in the Promethean story, of course, Promethe Prometheus has the foresight, but we don't know sufficient uh, stuff about Epitemus, the, 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 the other side, the, the, the brother uh, uh, of Prometheus, who was afterthought. So we, we, we need to take risks is important. We need, that's what enterprise is. So you wouldn't be going to the, you wouldn't be going to the, to the moon if you, didn't, if, you, if you didn't take risks. You wouldn't be engaged in rocket development if you, you weren't willing to take risks. We know about risks, but they're calculated risks. We know what the risks are. They're telling us openly that they have no idea what they're doing with this stuff. That, uh, that, that they are willing to take risks and they're willing to take risks with us and that there's a, because of the digital convergence, that an error over here can now come over here and affect something else. And they're happy with this because it's exciting for them. It's exciting for them, all this change. Inherent in this idea of the new world is another myth about novelty. That anything new is fantastic. Anything new is brilliant, like a new toy, and the toys for the boys, or this is what uh, Norbert Wiener talked about, gadget worship. And gadget was the word also that was used in relation to the atomic bomb. They love these machines. They're willing to risk anything. This is the Faustian pact. Faust is willing to give up his eternal life, which both you and me believe in, or that consciousness survives after that. What they're willing to do is to trade all that for the idea that they can have everything now, uh, that they can, their fantasies, their imagination can, uh, can be realized. And even applying these, they also believe that they can make themselves immortal. Uh, and interestingly, the myths deal with this. And we have the myth of Titanus, etc., that you get immortality, but you forgot to ask for youth, for example. So you're, you're old for eternity and you have the, uh, the problems associated with that. What Norbert Wiener said is that Yes, magic is there, there's no question. But what all the myths warn us about, and this is in Macbeth as well, that there is a literalism in magic, and if you get it wrong, you will suffer for eternally for this. This is a similar thing in the, in the Faustian Pact. So the nature of the left brain uh, is very literal, and that's why there's a great propensity, the great uh, ability to deal with, with figures and uh, mathematics and equations, which are very, very powerful. But there's a failure to understand some of the other values. What Theodore Rozak is saying, what 
what Norbert Wiener is saying, what Charles Musez is saying, is the world is a lot more complex than you uh, have allowed for. And at the higher levels, there's a greater uh, uh, complexity. And you also talk to Murray Gellman. And even in his work, uh, he talked about the indeterminacy at a certain level that what you think you know changes at a different level, on the quantum level, and that the rules that operate, say, in classics, don't operate. So the knowing that, the conceit or illusion that we can have power over things that we don't know is reckless. And, and the idea that we are, are giving uh, systems that were won through violent struggle for freedom against tyrants in, uh, in many contexts over hundreds of years, we're ceding that governance to a reckless, uh, reckless policy, a Promethean policy, which is willing to gamble with a lot of other things, but is committed to changing you and changing uh, humankind into its uh, crazy uh, dreams, um, is uh, w it's, it's worse than that, that, that metaphor going along the... But there is a recklessness. They are enjoying the ride and they are willing to... They are willing to sacrifice things on the way uh, and they're willing to sacrifice us on the way. So we need more care, more consideration, more critical thinking, uh, which is part of a compassionate thing, which, again, we both believe is inherent in the spiritual consciousness. It's, 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 it's inherent in the universe. It's what your work has tried to inculcate. It's what your demeanor and, and your practices inculcate that compassionate uh, sense we engage and we open to all all the complexity but we're, we're not naive about what that is involved and we recognize that there are deeper laws embedded in the universe and once you go against the deeper laws it mightn't happen today it mightn't happen uh, in, in this decade but it will happen it may even happen in the afterlife that the consequences will 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 come back and that's the, the karmic notion and all the traditions have this idea that the consequence of free will is that you have to accept the consequences uh, thereof. Uh, and and um, uh, I don't think there's a lot of evidence that the people that are leading the, the pack in this way have any concern about the consequence, have any commitment to the human being, to the dignity of the human or the human spirit. Uh, and and they're, they're quite clear and, and they're quite willing to also express their views that we are we are well it goes down the you know you start off with animals and then your your plants and then your you know your crystals and that etc so uh they're pushing us down the chain of being all the time and that's not where we're meant to be we're meant to be going upwards well james tunney once again a very thought-provoking stimulating conversation also a, a, a conversation that is to some extent disillusioning uh, in, a, in an awakening sense, but always a joy to be with you. And I'm looking forward to many more conversations. In fact, you suggested a very good idea that we focus on Edgar Allan Poe. I would love to do that. Thanks very much. I don't, I don't intend to be uh, disillusioning or disenchanting. Um, I um, uh, and I hope that's, but we have to recognise the real politic, uh, and in fact, the consequences vindicate uh, the approaches of the of the spiritual tradition, spiritual consciousness. It puts a premium on them. It puts them back at the centre. It says, yes, you can have all the technological sense, but you need to have a, a, a as with Mr. Bigelow, you need to have both. You need to have your awareness of the spir spiritual reality as well. Then it can work. That's different from denying spiritual reality and saying, look, uh, technology uh, is it. That's the materialist perspective. The example I would give to, f to, to finish off, I, was, oh, I, I like to swim in the lake as much as I can around the year, the whole year, and, and I was getting in the water the other day and there was a, a dragonfly which was, he, he was he or she well I don't know he was, he was he was there and I was wondering whether it was stuck in the water I was having a look see if it was alive and it was a beautiful thing absolutely beautiful the sun was shining through his wings kind of goldy gauzy wings it was it was really beautiful and I was poking it to see would it uh, would it move and the dragonfly is an interesting creature because they're uh, carnivorous uh, and uh, as far as I understand it they the larvae are in the water for years before they come out of the, uh, the water. And then they climb up a reed and 
the dragonfly, as we know, uh, knows that emerges from a an unattractive kind of body that they have underwater, and the, this beautiful thing emerges so they can fly and move in different domains. Um, and this is the same idea of the imaginal, of the chrysalis, of the idea in all the spiritual traditions, and, and Myers and his ideas as well, uh, and, and the, that, that element of the imaginal as well. And I think when you talk about uh, spiritual development, and uh, similar to my view as well, that there is in ingrained in us, inscribed in us, a capacity for initiation that's written in it if we take it there is the capacity to follow the signals so that we evolve as you have explained in relation to your dreams and that have you explained in the way your life has has been conditioned or, or helped by the mystical awareness uh reflect on Mas the truth of maslow's statement uh, etc so if the larvae is crawling up the reed and it begins to think too much about the next stage in its life, it's never going to move on to the next stage of its life. It's never going to be the beautiful dragonfly flying around. And we're at that stage. We're at the stage where we're failing to take that step of moving on to our full potential. We're moving on to the next step. And on a positive note, what uh, what is suggested by your views in relation to that inherent conflict, what is suggested in, in my view in relation to the, the, the imperative of spiritual evolution is that this alternative view that these people are putting forward and are being bold about in pursuit and determined and you have to give them credit for pursuing their, their, their dreams, for, for, for living. It shows that their dreams are stronger than the people that, that, that don't oppose it. That's all it shows. And, and in some ways, they are justifying their claim to some kind of superiority if we, we allow that to continue. So it's a challenge to us. And that challenge, I think, will be positive if we, if we take it. If we continue to recognize our spiritual consciousness, to recognize the spiritual consciousness of the other, to begin to apply the principles of care and compassion and consideration and critical thinking, uh, well, then we will be able to emerge in the next stage. So I don't intend to be uh, disenchanting. Uh, all I'm saying is that is the reality. And it is if you go to a lawyer and you want to know your position, they do you no favors if they don't tell you what the truth is. I'm an advocate for spiritual, for spiritual evolution. Uh, so are you. And I think we have to look at the possibilities and potential. Uh, people can criticize that that's wrong, you've misconstrued it, fair enough, that's great, that's discourse. Uh, but I believe that that's what's ha happening. And I believe it's a call to us to evolve. And that's the hopeful story. And I, I, all I want to emphasize in that is the significance of spiritual consciousness. And that's what, what, what you've been about. And the last point is, I urge people to look back at all those old interviews, to look back through the chain of your work, to see that you have been there from the start. There is no one else that has discussed these issues. So as well as your keen focus on parapsychology, you've been focusing on the nature of knowledge, uh, intelligence, in culture and consciousness. And that's there. And there's nobody who has had this series of conversations, which is really, really important. And uh, this is a, a very important aspect of, of your work. So I'm, I'm honored to have the opportunity to, to, to share that conversation with you and all, all the, the people that you have. And it's a dialogue. And I say that in a positive way that we can move forward and also try and convince people. We want elite defection from the other side to, to widen up. That, that's, that's what, convince them. Show them that the spirituality is real. Show them that uh, that all the parapsychological testament to the reality of more complexity in the universe is real, and show them that there is a better way. So thank you, thank you very much for the opportunity, as always, Jeff. Thank you, James. I'm honored to have this ongoing series of conversations with somebody who is so familiar with the history of my work. Sometimes I think you know my work better than I do. <laughs> I hope you're the same guy as that young man was in LD. <laughs> well, you know, some viewers have commented recently that in the old videos, I was very stern and I seem to have uh, more laughter and uh, uh, that I smile more. Never, I never saw the stern, but I didn't, I didn't pick up the, the stern 
uh, the, you didn't have the experience certainly that you do now or, or the but uh, I, I think that was appropriate at that time that place and also when you're doing 25 minutes like with Colin Wilson when you're doing that <laughs> he wanted to get so much in that you have limited time and you're very you're, you're very conscious of the thing so I didn't detect that sternness. Well, once again, thank you. And for those of you watching or listening, thank you, because you are the reason that we are here. I imagine that by now, many of you already realize that in conjunction with White Crow Books, we've just launched the new Thinking Aloud Dialogues book imprint, and our first title is, Is There Life After Death? New Thinking Aloud is a non-profit endeavor. Your contributions to the New Thinking Aloud Foundation make a meaningful difference in our ability to produce new videos.